Welcome to another episode of the Hope Strategy Podcast. I'm here with Josh Daimley and I'm your co-host, Corey Blake. Josh, how are you today? Doing great. Howdy, everybody. I had a great conversation just now with Jason Scott Earl, PhD. <laughs> I was teasing him at the beginning saying, Josh, you can't call him Jason during this call, even though we both know him personally. It's just Dr. Earl for the sake of this conversation. Jason is the director of the Willis Center for International Entrepreneurship at Brigham Young University of Hawaii. As an associate professor of business management, he teaches classes in strategic management, venture creation, and entrepreneurial management, areas of expertise developed during his career. He has conducted strategy and finance training for MBA students at Harvard Business School, as well as senior executives at General Electric, ABB, Insperity, AccuDyne, Marvel, and Illumina. Jason graduated from Brigham Young University with a bachelor's degree and master's degree in civil and structural engineering and was hired by ExxonMobil in New Orleans as a structural engineer. He completed his MBA in corporate finance at Tulane University while at the same time working full-time for Exxon as an engineer. After graduating from Tulane University, he moved to Southern California where he accepted a management position with World Minerals Incorporated as Director of Strategic Planning and Finance. And during his five years with World Minerals, he was heavily involved in the valuation and acquisition of 11 companies. He then went on to become the president of Starstone LLC, a leading material science technology company based in Santa Barbara, California. The parent company was acquired by a private equity firm in 2007 under the name iCrete LLC. Since that time, he has completed his PhD and taught at BYU-Hawaii, where he has worked with international students from over 70 countries around the world. The Student Social Entrepreneurship Group is run by the Willis Center at BYU-Hawaii and has won the national championship four over the last six years. Jason loves to spend time on a motorcycle with his beautiful wife, Natalie. They are currently in the midst of raising five boys and one little girl. That is a long bio, but it's one I wanted to read the entire thing of because Jason's somebody who's done a lot. And we talked all about this in the conversation, kind of the beginning to where he is now, like we do with a lot of people, but he has so many interesting kind of intricacies throughout his career of the directions he's gone and things that he's learned. I think there's going to be a lot for anybody to take from this conversation, whether they're wanting to get more education, understand the future of education with the Corona world that we live in now, entrepreneurship. I mean, he's, he's such a smart guy. I think one of the interesting things about Jason, which he called out during the interview is that He's a professor and we tend to have this view of professors who have been in the private corporate world uh, that, well, they must have failed at entrepreneurship or working in the private industry. And so that's why they're teaching because there's that saying, those who can't do teach. But Jason's one of those who's actually been very successful in the corporate world as an entrepreneur. And then because he was successful he was able to say, I'm going to go teach now and do something that I really want to do and love doing because I don't need the money because I was successful. And I hope that that is a new paradigm for people that we see more of that, that people who are successful do go on to teach because we definitely need that in the universities, people with that real world experience like Jason has. It come, you know, comes up in the conversation, but I am a firsthand beneficiary of his decision to go on and teach. I, I do have the experience and shout out to any educators out there, but I have had the experience that I'm sure you have where I was in college and I went and sat down with a professor talking about something, especially in some of like my entrepreneurship or business classes or something. And I was like, does this person know what they're talking about or did they just read this and they're telling me, you know, like that, I'm, is that, I'm trying, I'm having a hard time connecting those dots, but Jason is somebody who when at the kind of a climactic moment in his career after a big exit, making a bunch of money with one with a startup that he was involved with, he could have gone on and done a lot of different things. I'm sure a lot of doors were open. And instead he moved from Santa, beautiful Santa Barbara, California to Rexburg, Idaho and became a teacher. And then since then, hasn't just done a decent job and like lived a comfortable life teaching classes. You know, he's gone on to absolutely change the education game there at BYU-Idaho and then get an, a job as the director of the Willis Center at BYU-Hawaii. And the impact he's had on, on me, but I mean, hundreds of other students is something that, you know, he takes really seriously. And, and, you, and we had a good chance in this conversation to talk about where his priorities are and where he makes decisions from. And a lot of it is based on priorities that go way beyond money or way beyond successes, but more, you know, the outcomes that you get from trying to do good and be good and, and help others. So he, he's a great example of that. And I love the conversation. I'm excited for, for people to get a chance to listen in once we stop talking. We appreciate you listening. As always, remember to uh, 
follow us on Instagram and Facebook and leave us a review if you're enjoying the, the podcast. And for now, please uh, enjoy the next hour or so of listening to this conversation with Jason Scott Earl. Something is happening in our world. Time is very precious. I'm going to show you how great I am. Hope in the face of difficulty. More than machinery, we need humanity. Hope in the face of uncertainty. I'm better now than I was. I'm experienced now. Changing the world can happen anywhere and anyone can do it. The audacity of hope. This is the Hope Strategy Podcast with Corey Blake and Josh Steinle. This, uh, this feels like I'm sitting in your office, man. I know that place all too well. Obviously, the way that we like to approach this, Josh and I were fascinated with understanding the background of the successful individuals and whatever it is that they're doing, understanding a little bit more where they're coming from. And obviously, I know you personally and we've worked together. And so I'm excited to get to know you, your background a little bit more. You've obviously gone on and done some pretty remarkable things, both from a education, academic side of things, but also professionally and as an entrepreneur. And so we want to get to all of that. But the first question I have is tell us about your background. Tell us about where you grew up, what it was like. And maybe if you want to go into some detail on kind of how that shaped some of your ambition and some of your, you know, life direction. Yeah, I appreciate that. I I appreciate being here to speak with you and Josh. There's not really a lot to say. I think it was a typical Idaho upbringing. Like I had, I have two really great parents, wonderful siblings, but I was definitely, uh, I was definitely the invisible uh, kid, you know, growing up, I think through junior high and high school, there's, there's a huge focus, of course, like in most schools on sports and mine were much more solo. I was into um, fencing and rock climbing. So I was like one of those odd fencing in Idaho in central, weren't you like central Idaho? What town did you grow up in? Just outside of Idaho Falls. Amy. Okay. So huge fencing scene. A lot of, oh, a lot of yeah. Olympian fencers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, the rock climbing there was, was oh, pretty, pretty awesome too. But yeah, I mean, that's, I was on the fencing team in college and I think things really started to open up when I got to college. And, and I think, I think what happens is you kind of reevaluate who you are and your future and it just seemed like there was a whole world of opportunity out there. I think as a, as a parent now watching my own kids kind of go through that, it's, it's really interesting because you know that they're, they're thinking thoughts and they're, they're wondering if they have the ability and you just hope that there's a chance for them to see something that they're excited about, that they're willing to really put in the, the time and the effort. And then that seems to be where future opportunity comes from. So I had an uncle who really took an interest in me. He, helped me with my uh, math in high school. He said, you know, you would be a great engineer. And he actually took me with him to college classes. So I was like sitting in these like advanced mechanical engineering classes. And I was actually understanding what they were talking about. And As a teenager, like when you were in high school? Yeah. Like when I was 15 and 16. And I mean, I didn't really understand it, but at least I could grasp what they were trying yeah, to call them too. Yeah. And I suddenly realized like, man, I, I want to be an engineer. I want to build things and design things. And I, I really owe a lot of that to watching my dad build with his hands and then having my uncle be willing to like show me a future in engineering. So what did your parents do for work? What did your dad do or your mom? My mom's a stay at home mom with the kids. And my dad was a welder uh, building and welding things. And even on like nights and weekends, he was always working on some project to bring in a little bit of extra money. So I was there in the garage, like uh, he'd weld, I would ship the slag. I watched him build like thousands of things for everything from trailers to fireplaces to go-karts. But I, I do remember that the one kind of pivotal moment was um, laying on my back underneath my Ford Escort because the muffler had fallen off again. So my dad's trying to weld the muffler back on. And he's like, here, hold the steel plate between where I'm welding and the gas tank. So I'm laying on my back <laughs> in the ice, holding up the steel plate. And I remember thinking, man, I am not doing this the rest of my life. Like I've got to make something of myself because this is awful. And I have to say though, my dad did a, an amazing job providing for our family and, and really being a hands-on, you know, builder. Yeah. And then it's interesting to take that and then go into more of the theory with the design and, and engineering. Yeah, that is interesting. I didn't know that. You grew up around this idea of what was possible from a building standpoint and you, instead of saying, I'm going to jump into the family business of, of doing it with my hands, I'm going to get, I'm going to go and get an education and, and get more on the 
engineering side of it. I didn't realize that. That's awesome. So how did academics play a role in your upbringing? So you said you kind of had your own solo things that you did, rock climbing, fencing. Obviously, I know and we'll get into it. You know, you've got a bachelor's degree, a couple master's degree, a PhD. Was that something that from a from an early age you knew that you wanted to do? Did academics play a really critical role in, in your life personally? Was it a big family thing? You know, you had to get good grades and do this stuff in school or what was that role in your life as you were growing up? I think it was really born out of necessity, honestly. Like there's no way I could have gone to college and paid for it. And my parents, they were very supportive, but they were like, hey, if you want to do this crazy college thing, And that's on you. You got to find a way to pay for it. So I needed the scholarship. Like it wasn't really a choice. I needed the grades to pay for the school. And, and then I think once you realize that you're actually like good at something, you seem to have even more passion for it. We often, I think we confuse passion and purpose, but I found I could, I could compete at a fairly high level um, academic wise. And it, it allowed me to stay in school and it just seemed to open up a lot more doors. Yeah. I have an associates in engineering, a bachelor's in engineering, a master's in engineering. I mean, I was set to be an engineer for the rest of my life. And it wasn't until I was working for Exxon that like all of that changed. You said something interesting. It was out of necessity. Did your parents go to college? Yeah. My dad went to two years and got uh, an associate <clears throat> in welding technology. And he met my mom at college. She was there for a year. In your life successes so far, and we're going to get into more of not only have you been successful as an entrepreneur, but you've also also gone on to work with, I don't know at this point, what thousands of students who are in entrepreneurship programs and are, you know, cutting their teeth as entrepreneurs, but some of them have gone on to be incredibly successful in, in entrepreneurship. You've uniquely done that at a school, BYU Hawaii, where the target market, I can't remember what we call it, what you call it out there, but basically the target market for students is APAC, right? It's Asia and it's the Pacific. And it's a lot of students coming from areas where they didn't come from much, whether it's the Philippines or Malaysia or Mongolia. When it comes to making yourself or making things happen successfully out of necessity versus out of, I don't know what else, maybe drive or, I mean, what role does that that kind of, I got, I got nothing else. Like this is absolutely a necessity for me to succeed. What role does that play in the successes that you've seen in your own life and maybe in some of the lives of, of people you've worked with? I think the biggest thing is it gives you direction. Like when, when you do something out of necessity, and I think it really narrows the scope. There's maybe all of these potential options, but you realize most of them are not viable. And so it allows you to focus. And then focus um, is probably one of the most important things you can have, especially early in your career as you try to develop an area of expertise or knowledge. Um, it, is, it is a limiting factor, but it turns out to be one of the greatest benefits you can have, especially as an entrepreneur. I mean, one of the, the largest benefits is you have limited capital, you have limited resources, So you have to do things on a small scale and test it and then be willing to pivot and change. And it's why most large companies are terrible at entrepreneurship. They can go from zero to 60 with $10 million in capital and completely waste it. And so um, I think that's one of the reasons I love working with our students here is they do have limited options, but if we can help them say, Hey, here's an opportunity, let's really focus. And um, by the way, if you can't succeed at this, you probably can't feed your family. That provides all kinds of drive and initiative. So there are kind of two schools of thought here with entrepreneurship and education. There are some people out there who say, oh, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you don't need to go to college. You can just skip all that and just dive in and do it. But it seems like that that kind of depends on who you are. I was raised here in the United States and I look back on my college education. I feel like, yeah, I probably could have just jumped straight into running a business. But then I look at people coming from other countries or a different background. I mean, I was brought up by an engineer and a school teacher. So education was kind of part of my natural upbringing. But I look at people who come from more difficult circumstances, whether it's in the U.S. or outside the U.S. And my wife will tell me, like, for these people, college is like their only way out. Like if they don't do college, they can't get to that level Do you think there is a case to be made that for some people, education, I mean, for some entrepreneurs, education is a waste of time, but absolutely necessary for others? Or how do you look at that? That is the question. That's the ultimate question. And I think it it helps explain why there's such um, a disconnect between entrepreneurship and academia. I mean, these are two (laughs) disciplines that typically do not get along. It's like, it's like oil and water. But um, I think you got to take into account the survivorship bias. And so when we do look at these exceptional cases of people who didn't 
really need the education who jumped right in. What, what we're missing is about 10,000 other data points of people who tried the same thing and failed miserably. So I, I think the education component is critical. Um, maybe not so much for the skills because most, most education is pretty bad, but it's definitely important for the, the confidence, the ability to um, gain a network and, and have a brand to have something behind you that people will actually say, Hey, this is, this is someone who, who's paid a price. We've gotten to a certain point. We should take a chance on them. So yeah, I, I think the education component is critical and I feel a little hypocritical because, you know, I was a very reluctant entrepreneur. We did our startup because I was out of choices. There was like no way I was going to move back to um, another part of the country. My wife loved it in Santa Barbara. We wanted to stay in Santa Barbara. And so we just, you know, we, we found a way to make it happen. So the education piece is critical. And these people who say you don't need it, who seem like very successful entrepreneurs, if, in a moment of honesty, I think they would tell you how much they're reading, how much they're studying, how much they're, they're really providing their own self-education. Going back real quick to this necessity creates focus, like the, this, the, the absolute necessity to succeed. You, you have so much great context. You've worked with so many different types of entrepreneurs over the years. My, in my experience, a lot of entrepreneurs that I know, uh, including myself from time to time, lack focus. It's really hard for me to, to zero in on one idea because a part of a lot of very successful entrepreneurs, in fact, is kind of like this ADD or this like this, you know, it's hard to focus on one thing and see it all the way through. Josh is smirking at me. He knows we both know a lot about this. Do you have any tips or like as an educator as well in entrepreneurship, how, how do you get somebody to stay on task and focus on something and not just see it from A to B, but see it from A to Z all the way through? having seen so many of, you know, things you worked on or invested in go from, you know, an idea to, you know, an exit of some sort with big money on the table. I think the key there is the discipline, the self-discipline, but there are some tricks to kind of get there. One is definitely building a team. And as soon as you pick up a protege and have them focus on something, something, especially, you know, you should be doing, but you have someone else either that brought onto your team or they're an employee or a strategic partner that provides all kinds of motivation because now it's not just doing what you know you should be doing, but you're, you're helping someone and it provides a lot of internal motivation. So for example, right now I'm, I'm working on a book. I've been working on it for probably a couple of years now. And one of my students, uh, you know, he's, he graduated, he now works at Google, but he approached me with this idea and I'm like, hey, that's something I've wanted to do for a long time. We should we should work on it together. And so we have these weekly calls and, and I keep pushing things back and delaying things. But I really want him to succeed almost more than I, than I want a dumb book to go out. And I think having people like that, are they're kind of like running partners who they're working on it. And we don't talk a lot about this, but there's a lot of guilt knowing that you should be doing it and you're not. And your partner's killing himself to make it happen. And so I think identifying the right people to work with where you set the goal and you hold each other accountable is really the key. And if it was, if it's all just up to you and your own ability to discipline yourself and have focus, I think it gets really difficult. But when you've got, you surround yourself with good people, you, um, you put a lot of trust in them and they help hold you accountable. I think that's, I think that's one of the ways to get there. I like that. Obviously that's a big discussion in, in any entrepreneurship or business is like partnership versus not having a partner and keeping everything to yourself. Anyways, that's great insight. Let's back up a little bit. So you, you graduated high school, you went to Brigham Young University, you, you got an associate's in engineering, a bachelor's in engineering, a master's degree in civil and structural engineering. And then out of BYU, you were hired directly to Exxon, right? Right. Yeah. They came and recruited and they typically only take, yeah, the top 1% of the engineering students. I don't think you can do this nowadays, but they used to go in and ask for GPAs. Like they'd get the top like 1% and then, and then they would like find out which of those students were involved in certain clubs and maybe had Wait, you, some... can, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, I thought, I thought grades were like the last vestige of uh, discrimination, but yeah, I don't think you can do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's kind of interesting. You can't, you can't discriminate against somebody's, previous successes in school on whether or not you're going to give them a job. I need to take a note of that so I don't get sued at some point hiring people. <laughs> um, okay. So, so 
What was that experience like? I mean, Exxon, I'm guessing I'm no engineer, but I'm guessing Exxon is like you said, they take the top 1%. That's got to be one of one of the places to land. And um, did they, and then did you pack up and move to, was it New Orleans or something they, they shipped you to to start working or what, what, what was that transition like? And how, what was that experience like? Yeah, the headquarters were, for at least at the time, for their offshore operations were there in New Orleans. And so... What was your job title right off, right when you started? Uh, structural engineer. Okay. Just, just so we were designing and installing offshore oil platforms. It doesn't sound as impressive to talk about it today, but for, for the last 40 years, Exxon, later Exxon Mobil, was number one or number two in the Fortune 500. Like they just dominated year after year. In fact, I think in throughout the 80s and 90s, it was back and forth between Walmart and Exxon, but... Yeah, they were a big company. And the interesting thing was everyone was an engineer. Like their marketing guys were engineers, their finance people were engineers, their traders, obviously their operations guys. So it was a hardcore um, engineering company. They had incredible talent. And I would get into work about seven o'clock in the morning. And I remember coming around the office hall and every single door was open. Everyone was in their office. And then at six o'clock at night, I had to like sneak away to go to classes at Tulane and every door is open. Every light is on. I mean, that place operated like a machine. They just had really good talent and they were very motivated. You know, they compensated their people really well, but it was only after three or four months that uh, my boss pulled me into his office and, and said, Jason, you're a great engineer, but you're a terrible manager. My projects were like over budget and off, my schedule was way off and people offshore were getting injured. He said, we need to send you to assertiveness training. And in Exxon terms, that means you're this close to getting fired. <laughs> so I remember going to Austin, Texas for my two days of assertiveness training and it changed my life. Man, I, I mean, even to this day, my mom says I was a different person before I went to Austin, Texas and a different person after. And I came back and I fired everyone on the payroll. I uh, got a whole new, um, you know, we, we come in as engineers, but really we were running like $300 million budgets. I had about 400 contractors, two or three engineering firms. And I basically had to like learn how to, you know, run a small business and basically redo the budget, bring on yeah, a whole new team. And after that, I remember going into my boss's office when we, we finished putting in the platform, it was off the coast of Texas. And I said, Paul, please, please don't fire me. Like I've learned so much and I'm so sorry. And I, I think things are back on track. And he looked at my budget and he looked at my overruns and he was like, fire you. It's like, why would we fire you? We just, we just spent $30 million training you. Now we can actually put you on some real projects. And that was just kind of the way they operated. And I was like, throw you into the fire. And, and that's when they also said, Hey, we're going to pay for you to go to business school because you're missing some stuff in your education. I think if it wasn't for that, I would have never gone to MBA school. What did you learn in the assertiveness training that was so, I mean, what are the biggest takeaways from, from Yeah, this sounds like it must've been amazing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, (laughs) there was a lot that happened, but they pretty much laid out this spectrum of what it means to be passive and what it means to be aggressive. And then when they went through these scenarios, this is how you be assertive. And it doesn't mean we're mean or nasty or that we treat people poorly, but we're just very clear on the outcomes and how we're going to get there and the consequences if we don't reach those outcomes. And I'm not sure I can go into all the details of it, but it was, it was life changing. I mean, I walked away from that experience thinking, I need to do things differently. I need to run my life differently. And I need to let the people around me know uh, when they're performing and when they're not performing. And what I used to think of as very harsh and judgmental, now I see as actually very open and honest and actually caring. When you let people know what the expectation is and then let them know when they achieve it, they really rise to the occasion. And it was, it was something that, you know, I thought I'd learned, you know, growing up and living in Europe for a couple of years and, and taking all these classes. But it, it wasn't until I was actually in the seat, making the decisions, hiring and firing people. That's where I, I learned how important that skill is. So assertiveness is being able to set and manage expectations, hold people accountable with, while being able to take any of the emotion out of it. Are you saying kind of removing that emotion and just saying, let's understand what our end goal is and let's set the steps and processes and procedures and people and whatever in place to get there. And then let's just communicate openly and directly and with no feelings being hurt in order to reach that end goal. Is that, I mean, does that sound fair? Emotion is definitely the enemy. You, you Mm -hmm. really need to be careful with that. I mean, if you want to go home and like watch a movie on Netflix with your wife and be emotional, sure. Like I'm all for that. 
but when, when it's time to like make a decision, you really need to keep the emotion out of it. And I, I think there's a good way to balance that with what Kim Clark taught at HBS. He, he said that we should be firm minded, but not hard hearted. So I think if we can keep that in mind, right, where we're, we're making the decision, we're very firm about it, but at the same time, we're not, we're not trying to hurt people or be vindictive or anything like that. So when you were at Exxon, they paid for you to go to Tulane and that's when you got your master. Was it an MBA? Was it a master's in business? That's right. Okay. Yeah. In corporate finance. So you, again, continue the education. Now let's not forget that this isn't like, you know, some single guy coming out and working for Exxon and then, oh yeah, I'll go get some more education. I mean, you were building a family at the same time. So when you were in New Orleans, how many kids did you and Natalie have while you were trying to juggle those early mornings? And you weren't just like, well, going into the office and leaving, you were going to a helipad and getting on a helicopter and going out to check on oil platforms. Yeah. And then coming back late and then going to night classes, right? And and how many kids did you have at home at the time? We had two at the time. Okay. So and you now have six. Yeah, six. And we've got, yeah, five boys born in five different states. So we've definitely been around. Uh, no, it was it was definitely a struggle. Yeah, a typical morning would be drive to the heliport, fly offshore, check on my projects. Then come back, uh, yeah, land in New Orleans. Go into the office, check in with my boss, let him know. I mean, it's funny to talk about now, but you know, in 1998, 1999, we did not have cell phones. And so I had to like report face to face with my boss and this is what's happening. shoot him a text. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then jump in the car. Yeah. Drive to Tulane. Classes usually went from like six to nine, 930. And then we had our group projects. Yeah. Then drive all the way back home. By that time, the boys are in bed. So I'm just basically kissing the boys goodnight. And then, and the next day doing it all over again, it was crazy. Yeah. So what was the great motivator behind all that? How did you stay sane and how did you stay ambitious and optimistic through that's, that's rigorous, you know, that that's a lot. And I'm, and I'm sure you were missing your wife and missing your kids. And I mean, what was the end goal in all of this? What kept you motivated? I like to say I stayed motivated the whole time, but I'll, I'll admit it was hard. I halfway through, I, I was ready to quit. I went to one of my professors he was actually my project management professor at Tulane. And I, I said, I can't do this anymore. It's, it's killing me. It's going to destroy my marriage. This is just not working. And he was a pretty calm guy. And he suddenly got very assertive with me. Just, I remember him standing up in his office looking down. I mean, he was mad. He was like, how old are you? And I said, I'm 27. How old are you going to be next year? Uh, 28. That's right. You're either 28 with an MBA or you're 28 without an MBA, but you're going to be 28. You decide what you want and what you're going to do about it. And he just, he let me have it. Wow. And I walked away thinking, wow. Like, and, and that's, I think really when I just had a, a real heart to heart with Natalie about, okay, let's, let's see what we can do to finish this out and then see where we're supposed to go next. And then, so yeah, we finished that last year of school. Um, the interesting thing is just as I got my MBA, company was going to move me on a project in Africa and I was going to be away from my family. Like they have this weird schedule, like six weeks on two weeks off that made, that made the decision pretty simple. Like we need to, we need to find something else because it's one thing I think to always be away from your family, like during the day, but not for six weeks at a time. So that's when we made the decision to leave. Yeah. And that was like long-term six weeks away, two weeks with the family, six weeks away, two weeks with for like, who knows how long. Yeah. Usually it's these overseas assignments are usually two or three years. Uh, that'd be rough. Yeah. yeah. You went after, after Exxon, you got a job offer to be a project. Was it a project manager at world minerals? Right. And that was all the way across the country. So now you're in new Orleans, you've started to build a career in Exxon. They're about to ship you off to Africa literally. And you're like, <laughs> all right, you know, we've, we've done enough. What, what did world minerals do? And how did, how did that job come to come to be? Well, that's, so that's the magic of an MBA. And I'd like to think the magic is still there 20 years later, but people think you can do things that you have no right to be doing. So it was actually a position in strategy and finance, but they wanted someone with an engineering background. The reason why we, we chose that location was we were actually installing the last offshore oil platform that California will ever see. So I'd actually been out to Santa Barbara quite a few times. We were working on the project. And I remember calling up Natalie saying, man, this place is amazing. Like I've, I've been to the big cities in California, but Santa Barbara was like this it's beautiful, magical <laughs> land of yeah, ocean and mountains. And I remember we were finishing up the project. I, I got on a website. Again, this is going to totally date me. It was, um, it was not indeed. It was called monster.com. Yeah. Josh, you remember monster. 
Yeah, what happened to Monster.com? They were huge. They were huge. That was a great site. I remember um, Monster. I feel like we might have used Monster like seven years ago, didn't we? I don't know. They kind I of remember faded the commercials. away, though. Yeah, I remember the commercials for Monster.com. So I, I got on there, typed in engineer, MBA, and some crazy salary. And this job posting for World Minerals popped up. And I remember seeing the logo. And I'm like, that's, I've seen this thing. And I'm in some downtown Holiday Inn hotel in Santa Barbara and we're like leaning back and pushing the curtain back and looking out and their headquarters are like right across the street. I was like, what? That is amazing. So I called them and they said, yeah, I would go ahead and apply online. And I said, Hey, I'm, I'm right in town. Can I, can I just drop off my resume? And they said, no, that's okay. You know, just, just email it to us. And as I hung up the phone, I remember thinking, I am not going to get this job. And Fortunately, I brought my suit jacket with me on trips to go to church on Sunday. So I threw on my suit jacket. I printed off my resume. I walked over there and I introduced myself. And it was the, the lady at the front desk was the same lady who had taken my call. She's like, and oh, she's, you again. She's like, Jason, I just told you, just email it. <laughs> and I said, Joan, I know, but I'm, I'm here and I'll save you a 2,000 mile flight from New Orleans. And I just, I just love to talk to the CFO. And she said, well, and, and there was that, that, that critical moment, you know, where they could just kind of pause. Yeah. And again, this, I think this goes back to that assertiveness thing, you know, where you're, you're not overly aggressive. Maybe I was a little aggressive, but you're just letting them know, Hey, I'm here and I'm willing. But she said, let me go see if he's got a minute. So she went back, talked to John. He let me come back. And so I was back there for like two hours and we had this great conversation. And at the end of the conversation, he, I remember looking at like, my resume looking at me and then he was looking at this big stack of papers and he's like, we've had a lot of resumes come in and you seem like a great fit. So I go, we'll fly you back in two weeks to meet the rest of the board and um, we'll, we'll see how it goes from there. And, and that was it. That's how I got the job. And we made the move from new Orleans to, to Santa Barbara. And you were at world minerals for how long? Uh, five years. So we were part of a, an acquisitions team. It was, it was a combination of engineers and accountants, but we basically, we're acquiring other companies and building up their portfolio. I'm going to jump forward. Cause then you, did you start the next company that you were at or did you get involved in an early startup as one of the like founding members or what was that was Starstone, right? So what was the, what, what was the transition from world minerals to this next endeavor? And that was in Santa Barbara as well, right? You stayed close. Yeah, it was. Well, I learned that if you live by the acquisition, you tend to die by it. So they had sold the company to a, a large French mining company and they were going to move our headquarters and I had been talking with people in the Santa Barbara area that were basically working on the idea for a new startup. They had, they had just recently gone through the sell of a big part of their company and they still had some intellectual property and they were, so they were looking at this new startup with Starstone. So yeah, that's when I joined them and, and came on as the president of the company. And what did you do there? I feel like there were some big projects that came out of that company before an oh, eventual yeah. exit. We were a really small group starting. We went from about three people to 63 people in 18 months. And our big focus was on high strength concrete mix designs. So my role was really putting together the financial models and working on the, the demos and the prototypes. And then we landed these big projects all over the country in Chicago, in New York City with the Freedom Tower. It really, it really came down to... Freedom Tower is the the new world trade center, right? The one that is where the world trade centers once stood. Yeah. 30 floors of concrete and the core, that's all our concrete. And wow. And a lot of that came from us as we started to pick up more projects. We had a, a private equity group out of Beverly Hills called Pacific capital group. They, they got really involved. They invested uh, in us and then they started making these introductions to these. What was the difference in I Crete versus Concrete. Why, why, like how, how, I, I don't know this. Most people I'm guessing don't know the, the game of how to land a contract with the building for the type of cement you're using or whatever. I mean, what was the, yeah. <laughs> what's the difference? Nerd out with us on, on what you, cre what you guys created there. Well, initially it was, you know, a bunch of engineers with a laptop and an algorithm, but what you learn pretty quickly is the, the network. Like, like these, these guys in Beverly Hills, they had really high level car, uh, contacts with the uh, architects and the designers. And so they could get us in with like the New York Port Authority, who's actually putting together the initial designs. And then when they saw the quality of our concrete, they specced us right into the design. So the contractors had no choice. They had to use iCrete. And that was the real shift in strategy because initially we were just focused on small 
batch plant operations, helping mom and pop places save money on producing concrete. And when we could show that the higher the quality of the concrete, the more you could actually save and the better consistency and higher strength. That's, that's really when we kind of changed and focused more on architects and designers versus just the operations people. You eventually sold that company for what? $15,000, $15, I think is what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With a couple of zeros missing, but yeah. Like that. <laughs> so, and then, I mean, at that point of the exit, did they acquire the team as well? Whoever, whoever brought you guys out or did you, or did you just walk away? What was that transition? Cause now I'm, I'm in, I'm interested in this next transition because we're going to go from like, obviously you've built now a very successful career going from a ton of academics and getting the right degrees to starting at a really legitimate company and building a resume, almost getting fired, learning to be assertive, you know, growing and, and scaling your teams there and then taking advantage of some opportunities. I'm just recapping everything we said <laughs> for to, to world minerals. And then now you're the president of more of a startup with three people. You grow that, you scale it, and then you sell that for a bunch of money and have a payday at that point. And then, and then after that, we're going to talk about kind of how you jumped into what probably a lot of people would say is a kind of a weird next step, which is yeah. kind of volunteer teaching, right? And then and, and teaching. So at that point, when, when Darstone sold, was it an option to stay on? Did you stay on for a little bit or was it like, a, okay, I just made, you know, a lot of this work has paid off at this point. Now I can do whatever I want and I'm going to make that decision. Or where, where were you at? I, I think there's two major things that all entrepreneurs face. It's either massive elation and this top of the mountain feeling, or it's absolute total regret. Like, why did I, why did I not sell earlier? Why didn't I wait to sell or why did I sell it all? So I think the big thing that helped Natalie and I was we just made a decision. Like if, if we are at a certain point and we know that house is taken care of, there's savings for the kids, for school, education, to go on missions. And, and we know that, you know, we're basically taken care of, then we should be ready to walk away at that point. We kind of, we kind of like, we kind of drew a line in the sand. We said, you mm -hmm. know, We've seen, we've seen a lot of people where it's never enough and we don't want to have that regret. So we're just going to say, if we reach this point, we're good. And the funny thing is we're getting the company ready for sale and this is all happening. And I, I get a call from BYU, Idaho saying, Hey, we opened a position. We want someone to teach finance and startups to engineers. We can't find anyone crazy enough to leave the world of private equity, but you know, we'd love to, we'd love to have you, you know, take a look at the position and there was just this feeling of like, yeah, this is, this is what should happen next. I, I, I thought it was going to be short lived. I thought it would just be like a one year sabbatical, just try to teach. And um, when Natalie and I went up there to Idaho, we met with Kim Clark, who was the president at the time. And we met a bunch of the people there. And there was just this really strong feeling of this is what we should do. I didn't even really question it. It's just like, this is what needs needed to happen. I, I think for Natalie, it was a pretty tough move. I mean, you, you move any girl from her California home to Idaho and it's going to be rough, but even she admitted it. She's like, yeah, this is, I don't know why, but this is what we're supposed to do. And it honestly, it made zero sense because I was driving my career into a brick wall. Like, I mean, does anything good come out of Idaho? I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, not a lot, but it turned out to be this amazing experience because it opened up this whole new world of consulting and I feel like I was continuing to learn. We started running these simulations that were pretty new to the program. And people back East were contacting us saying, hey, like, when did you guys start an MBA program at BYU-Idaho? And I'd say, well, actually it's undergrad and these are freshmen. And they, they were blink and not believe it. They were blown away. They came out, they looked at the program, looked at what the students were doing. And um, we were invited to run these training programs at GE and Harvard Business School. And it, it just, it opened up this whole new world that I didn't expect. And I, I really fell in love with it. I, I think there's something about knowing something's true. And then when you go in and teach it, and then you realize, wait, that's not completely true. <laughs> and you go back and you kind of refine what your own understanding is. But then to see your students go out and, and use that, to use those principles and use those truths and find success. I mean, there is nothing more rewarding. I mean, I would even say in your case, Corey, like seeing what you were doing in the classroom and then what you were doing early in the morning to, to build the company and, and work with Josh and build your clientele. 
I mean, you might, you might say there's like a sadistic component to this, you know, <laughs> where I'm no longer engineering with steel and concrete. I'm like engineering with people's minds, but you see what they, they, they're capable of and what they can accomplish. And it's, in my mind, it's the ultimate. It's really, it's been really fun to watch. It's kind of like having kids and raising a family in a way, isn't it? Yeah. Only you, at some point you just like, just send them off and you don't have to pay their tuition. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they actually pay you tuition. <laughs> I think it's uh, I think it's worthy context to to give a little background on this because the the episode that actually released today is an interview that Josh did with me last week, oh. and we had we had had a couple of people reach out on the podcast and said you know hey we're you know we like this it would be cool to get to know Josh and Corey better because you know who knows where these guys are coming from they're interviewing some really cool people so anyways we 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 released an episode with me and and we told the whole story of my time at BYU Hawaii and. I guess to plug in, you know, this is all going to tie together for people, but Jason was my first, I think my first professor in entrepreneurship. I was studying communications. I was studying international culture studies. I, Josh, Josh and I talked about before, like I was thinking about being a dentist and maybe figure, trying to figure out what I was going to do for a career. I met Jason as a, as a professor initially, and he let me into a class that I was not qualified to be in. I think based off of just some conversations and hearing what I was working on, because I know there were some prerequisites that I just didn't have. And you were kind of like, just jump in and we'll figure it out. And I had no, I mean, talk about getting it over your head. I had no idea. It was a different language from day one. And you got Jason, who's like this really smart, well, very experienced business, you know, engineer minded guy. And I'm like, I am in the wrong spot. I don't know how I ended up in this room. But we built a relationship and, 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 be, and Jason quickly became an a incredibly valuable mentor to me. When, we, when Josh and I started MWI 2.0, as we call it, and we started building things up, Jason was, was the board of advisors with, with uh, one other person. And it was like, I was spent, that's why I joked at the beginning, like I spent a lot of time sitting where I'm now looking from, from Phoenix, Arizona, <laughs> but just asking questions. And right, if you look right to Jason's left, to my right, there's a whiteboard there. And we mapped out how to build a business on that whiteboard. Like, and, and he, and he helped me a lot. So yeah, just to take a view of that whiteboard. <laughs> yeah, there it is. I bet maybe you can still see a piece of what we talked about. Again, I, I think a lot of people, this is a really fascinating transition because when you reach a point financially and, for, and from a success standpoint, as the world sees it, right. From a business standpoint, from a finance, fi financial standpoint, you have this exit. Like you said, you and Natalie as a team talked about it and said, you know, we're not trying to become billionaires here, but when we've got enough money to be able to provide for our family and, and, and reach some of those long-term goals that we have, let's then walk away and, and take some next steps. But again, to what most people look at is they say, okay, well, how are you going to take that money and go turn it into more money? Or how, and, and maybe, you know, I'm sure you have in, in other ways, but, or how do you take this experience and go from a professional or a business standpoint, go start another business? you then went, <laughs> again, you, you took kind of a hard right and went to academia and started teaching at a smaller university at BYU, Idaho, going back to kind of the motivations. And obviously this being the hope strategy podcast, we, we talk a lot about, and we're going to get to your opinions on hoping a strategy here in a minute, but there's got to be more to it, right? There's got, there's more to it for you foundationally. And I know you personally, so there's, there's a lot more to it than just those successes and those financial wins and those, any, any of that. Can you talk to me a little bit about where that comes from and why you would make a decision to go and start working with young students for very, you know, a, a minor salary compared to what you had been doing? And I mean, what are some of the motivations there and what, what gave you kind of the hope or the ability to be able to do that and, and really give it your all like you did when you were making a bunch of money for going into work every day? You know, for some reason, I, I keep thinking back to that picture of both of you and Josh on your website where, um, initially <laughs> you made the decision to maybe I guess MWI was already going, but you kind of made the decision to really start to work together. Well, Are you I talking think about Josh, the bearded picture of Josh. Yeah. The bearded picture of Josh. That was a way before. Not Josh, way even before that. Yeah. 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 I was 18 what? in that picture and Josh was, Josh was, conf I had just found Josh wandering in the desert and, and he threw him in the back of my truck and we drove, drove. On. <laughs> I just, I think that is such a great depiction of two people they could have gone two totally different directions. And I just think through, through focus and discipline and hard work got where you are now. And, and for me, it's not, a, it's definitely not a dollar thing. If you want to find people who are truly wealthy, you find people who feel like they have enough. And all you've got to do is go to some of these South Pacific islands that no one talks about Vanuatu, Tuvalu, Nauru. I mean, these places, they are 
paradise. Like they're now don't, don't get me wrong. There's no electricity and there's no running water, but there's more than enough food and the people don't know they're poor and they live this. I mean, they're some of the happiest people you'll ever find in the world. And it just, it just, I think it just dawned on Natalie and I that when you, when you feel like you have enough, that's when you're truly wealthy. As I think about this whole journey, seeing students come in who I think are, are hungry, they are passionate, they have these ideas, and then helping them kind of connect the dots on like, this is how we're going to get you from here to where you want to be. And we're going to hold you accountable. We're going to affirm you and tell you that you're great even when you're not. But we're also going to let you know, hey, this, these are the areas where you need to improve to get there. It's just been really um, a gift. It's it's, it's, it's amazing to see students do this and, and especially the ones who feel like they, they don't have that ability. Like they're, maybe there's desire, but they're just, there's that, that element of hope is not there. And to, and to help them see that be, become developed over time. I just, I can't think of anything more rewarding. And as far as the dollar amount, I think the last example I would point you to is this little museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. We had students landing jobs at Walmart out of BYU-Idaho like crazy. So we would go out there and um, show them kind of the operations and introduce them to people at a pretty high level in Walmart. But I always took my students to this little museum that was kind of focused on the, the origins and the start of Walmart and Sam Walton. And my favorite place to, to point them to was this old Ford pickup truck. It was Sam Walton's favorite truck. He drove it for like 30 years. And the reason why it was his favorite is because if you looked close at the steering wheel, there were like dog bite marks all over the steering wheel. And that man loved his dog and he loved that truck. And he, his favorite thing to do was to go out hunting with his dogs. And um, I'm not, you know, hyper passionate about old pickup trucks and steering wheels, but I think there's a huge lesson in there. Like when you can learn to value the things in life that you can't put a dollar amount on and then devote your life to those things. I, I think that's where you find your greatest reward. And um, even to this day, I look at, you know, some of my prominent students are and what they're doing and I'm so proud of them. But I also look at my students who are simply, you know, back in the Philippines and, and working with their families and they're running a small business. They're happy. Like they, they can provide for their families. They feel like they're, they're part of something bigger than just themselves and they're creating jobs in, in their own little way. You know, they're changing the world. So I think, I think those are the two examples. That's awesome. I've never heard that story, the Sam Walton story. We had Elvin on a couple of weeks ago, well, about a month ago now. And he's obviously one of the, in many ways, he's been one of the poster boys of, of the Willis Center, right? So, so Jason now is the director of the Willis Center for International Entrepreneurship at BYU Hawaii. But Elvin has an amazing story and I loved interviewing him because as you know, he was in, he, I taught him when I was a, a teacher there with you and got to go to the Philippines with them and stuff. But can you give me another story or two, or maybe if some of these students coming from, again, because you've had the privilege at this point to travel all throughout the world, really on, on BYU Hawaii's, on a mission for them to, to, to find and help great students come to the school and, and gain an education. And one of the things that BYU Hawaii, a lot of people don't know about this, is it's one of the smallest campuses for a university, but it's also one of the most diverse. I mean, there's kids from everywhere there, all over the world. And the mission isn't to have these students come in and then stay in the U.S. and to, you know, go move to Silicon Valley and do whatever, right? Or, you know, go do what a lot of people dub as entrepreneurship. The real mission is to have these students come in, learn how to build businesses, learn how to be leaders, and then go back to where they're from and help build up their communities and build up the economies and build up the, you know, their families and things in, in these locations where they're from. Not that they're push to not do the other, but that's kind of the, the real end goal, right? Is to make oh, the world a better place through entrepreneurship and through teaching all these amazing students. Just for the sake of time, one other story of a student who's done this from a place that otherwise, you know, they just never would have had the opportunity and, and kind of some of the miracles or some of the, you know, huge wins that you've seen, you know, throughout that process. Yeah, we really focus on teaching three things here. The focus on learning how to learn, learning how to make money, learning how to live a life of meaning. But the way we found that this best works, especially in these countries where there are no jobs, is to bring together three different disciplines. So the engineering, the education, and the entrepreneurship. The engineering piece is typically, we need something, some, some kind of technology or something. It doesn't have to be cutting edge, but something that changes the game. We need something there that's new and different. 
on the education piece, a lot of it just comes down to helping them understand a business model that works, building something that's actually sustainable. And then the entrepreneurship piece is finding opportunity where most people see like zero opportunity. And one of the big flags we've noticed is corruption. If you go to one of these countries and you find corruption, that is a huge signal that there's an opportunity there, that the system is not working. Things are not running the way they, they could be. There's major inequities or inefficiencies. And so most you know, smart money investors would avoid corruption at all costs. And we actually think it's great. Like show us something that's corrupt and we're going to show you a better way to do it. And I think that's what we saw with, with Elvin and what he's been doing with agriculture and in, in the Philippines. Another example I think would be Eritai in uh, Kitabase. It's one of these Island nations that's ground zero for ocean levels rising and that is a little bit of a misnomer. It's not so much the oceans rising as, as it is that the king tides are just eroding these atolls and these islands. And, and within, they're saying within 40 to 50 years, they'll be completely inhabitable. And the president of Kitabase went out, made a deal with Fiji, bought some other islands so they could basically move the entire nation. And these people don't want to leave. They're like, we are not moving. Our great, great grandparents were born here. They died here. We're going to, we're going to die here. And so there, there's like some real incentives to find a way to, you know, alleviate these huge problems. And one idea that one of our marine biology students came up with was actually taking recycling cars, putting them out on the reef and then attaching an electrical current to them. And then it's basically like a floating solar panel. And with a small voltage of current, you can actually build up the calcium carbonate on the car frame and, cl- and plant these baby coral and the coral grow like mad. They, they just, I don't know if it's the voltage thing or having like these, um, these actual structures to build on. And so we're looking at ways that we could actually take care of a huge problem, which is a lot of cars that have been thrown by the side of the road or wasted. We could clean them up, take off the paint, all the plastics and oils and all that, and then repurpose them, put them out on the reef and basically strengthen parts of the, the reef to help protect the island while also providing a better habitat for fish and increasing fish population. So I think it's just, it's just one example of a student going back to his country. Um, He's had a lot of other projects there. He's run with hydroponics and working closely with the government. But in my mind, it's just these, these three pieces coming together, the, the engineering piece, the education piece and the entrepreneurship. And, and the last thing I would point out is, we often put entrepreneurs on this pedestal and they're in the spotlight and they, they kind of beat their chest and say, look at me like that does not go over well in these emerging countries. Like it, a much better approach is the entrepreneur who's basically helping the entire village. The, the spotlight's not really on them, but they are the catalyst that, that brings in the resources and, and creates the jobs and kind of helps the whole community rise. And so it's definitely a different take on entrepreneurship uh, we're not really into nonprofits. We, we, we like to build things that are sustainable and actually create cash flow. But I, th- I think we try to approach it in a way that's yeah, finding these, these real problems and finding solutions and, and helping these students know that they, they can make a difference. That would be my, my one example. Yeah. One of many, right? There's so many, man, what a, what a great privilege I had to be out there and work with so many students from all over. It was, it's, it was fascinating. I'm going to, I'm going to transition a little bit into academics because you're somebody who's gone through pretty much every level of academia that you can as a student, right? You went through the whole thing. You got your PhD now for the past, what is it 10 years or something or 15 years? How how long have you been on the other side? 12, 12 12 years. Okay. So now you've been on the other side and, and you and I have talked a lot about this because one of the things I remember early on when Josh and I started working out there, working together and building up MWI, I had an iPad, an internet connection, and that was it. I was making my phone calls from my iPad. I was your cell creating, phone. Yeah. 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 And my, so I was making phone calls through Google voice from my iPad. I was putting together proposals, whatever I needed. Right. I was, I was literally Google searching things that I didn't know the answers to in real time as people were asking them so that I could try to drive business and, and answer questions and not look dumb. Right. And 
you and I talked a lot about that when I was a student. And I remember, I remember that specific conversation. You brought up that multiple times. You just have an iPad and an internet connection and you're able, you know, this is what, this is the message we need to get to these students that are going back. And, you know, I, I've been to a couple of these places as well. And I've seen what the future can hold for a lot of these up and coming uh, economies because of technology, because of the internet when, when used the right way. But we've also talked about the other side of that, where what the heck's going to happen with colleges and universities and education as a whole. And it's been interesting because you and I have talked about this a lot, and I know you have a lot of opinions on this, but during the last six to eight months, you know, with the coronavirus, it, it has absolutely forced our hand for better or for worse to educate digitally. Campuses with thousands of students are ghost towns right now, and students are sitting in their dorms being educated. What do you see as the, of the future of education? You know, we don't need to talk about uh, elementary and high school and stuff. We'll figure that out. But specifically secondary education, what do you see as the future there and where's the hope in it? The, the shroud is off. People can finally peer into higher education. And for the first time in the world, people can see what a bad Zoom class looks like. So yeah, it's, it's not pretty. I think what's really happened is we've jumped into the future about 10 to 15 years. And if, if I've had any kind of toehold in this market, it's because of that age old saying that those who can do and those who can't right, teach, which is, by the way, it's a terrible saying. <laughs> and so there are, I'm convinced there are some educators out there that can do both. They can do it and they can teach it. And I think this is a huge opportunity for them because this is a chance, I think, for a lot of well-meaning people to find a platform and put their own foot back in education and, and really help. Like we, there's so many skills now that can be gained just in the way that you did. I think you did it more through hard work and effort, but with a a decent internet connection and with a a tablet or a laptop, yeah, you can learn these skills in project management and digital marketing. And so I think there's going to be a dramatic shift. We can see how these bigger companies like Google are saying, all you got to do is take these, this one class for 75 bucks a month. And if you get this certificate, that's going to be equivalent to a bachelor's degree, which I mean, that, that right there just changes the game. Yeah. But it also, it shows that they're only going after a particular field. And there's a lot of things that students need besides just passing some class. Like they need that confidence. They need a network and they need the brand. Education still plays a role, I think, in providing some kind of certificate, but we need to see a much stronger focus on the networking piece and, and demonstrating that, hey, here's, here's a brand that says, if you've got the certificate, you now can do these things. You didn't just, you know, sit through so many hours of class, but you actually, we have metrics to show you went out, accomplished these things, did these things, passed this assessment, and, and now you're, you're capable just kind of in that real quick. So you, you've taught a lot of classes online. You're forced to teach online now, but previously you did have some online classes. And then you also have taught a lot of classes, obviously in person with a lot of students. What are the pros and cons? I mean, I'm sure there's a bunch of them, but kind of high level, what are the pros and cons that you see? And is it possible and is it sustainable to assume that, that students online are going to get as good of an education as they would if they were physically on campus, you know, in class? The games change. So if, if we can show our students how to play the new game, I think it actually is a huge advantage. We had a student who graduated here five or six years ago. He's pretty high up in Tesla right now. He's one of the few employees that works at both Tesla and SpaceX. And he was telling me just last week, he's like, Jason, he's like, I'm, I'm tall, I'm bald, I'm muscular. When I walk into a room, I command respect and we get things done. He's like, now I'm on Zoom calls. He's like, and none of that works at my advantage. He's like, I'm just another face on the screen. So he's, he's totally rethinking how he gets work done at Tesla, you know, probably one of the most impressive companies in the world. And so in the past, what students learned in the classroom was how to be a student in the classroom, which is a terrible thing to learn. But now I think we can say, Hey, look, I'm, we're stuck in this stupid zoom call, but guess what? The this level. is how it's going to be for you. This is, this is what you're looking at for the next two or three years. And if we could teach our students how to get stuff done in this new environment, I think they could actually be very capable, not just as employees, but as future entrepreneurs. Well, Corey and I were talking about this right before you got on, Jason, that we've had experiences with employees where, because we have a very free environment at MWI where most people are working remotely. I mean, everybody's working remotely now, but even before 
COVID, everybody was pretty much working remotely. And so we depend on people to be proactive and get stuff done and manage their time wisely and everything. And every once in a while, we'll bring somebody in that we've interviewed and we've vetted and we think they're really great, but then they just don't know how to work on their own. Like they don't know how to do it. And this situation is forcing everybody to learn how to do that, it seems. Yeah. And I I think that's why the education component needs to change where we're not having students uh, listen to PowerPoints and read articles and answer quizzes, but we need to have, I mean, we need to have specific assigned projects where they have to go and take initiative and do it and then come back and say, Hey, this is what I learned. This is what I tried. This is what I failed at. And this is what I'll, I'll do differently. That class that you took, Corey, I think was our cash and valuation course. Mm-hmm. And everything in that course is on helping a student find a client and put together a valuation for the client. And I'm amazed at how much, how, how freaked out the students are because it's the first time they've ever had to pick up the phone and talk to someone and sell them something. And, and in this case, it's not even really a sell. It's, hey, I'll, I'll do a free valuation, but I need access to all your financials. And as you know, most small businesses uh, really don't like that. And, and to watch them go through this process of putting together an offering memorandum and putting a forecast together and getting feedback from the client. Like I, I can tell you the students who successfully make it through that would be great new hires. Like they, they actually had to go out and actually apply these skills and and do it. And I think that's where the opportunity is in education. I don't think it's going to be a lot of the major players that we see now that figure it out. I think think there's going to be a lot of new and upcoming educational platforms that give students a chance to do that, to have a, a mentor who actually knows what they're talking about, can guide them through that process and then hold them accountable and say, yeah, I I can sign off on this student. I've seen what they've done. I know they can do it in the future. I I really think that's going to be the future of education. So it sounds to me, I mean, the the long and short of it is that uh, playing field has been leveled again, right? The internet has, has leveled the playing field in a lot of ways over the last 20 years. But, but, but one thing that's been lagging is education and academics and, and just kind of the, the institution of the whole thing. And now I, I, I agree. I think it's going to be an interesting five, 10 years just to see that there's going to be so much opportunity to disrupt this whole space of education. I remember when I was a student studying international culture studies, we read the book, The World is Flat by, is that what it's called? The World is Flat by Tom Friedman, I think is what it's called. Yeah. It was this kind of, even in 20, in 2000, what it was that 2011 or 2012, it was, it was kind of this idea that was still new to a lot of the students in the classroom. And my teacher was maybe 65 years old or something. And it was like, is the world flat? You know, that was the big discussion. Like, is the world, has the world meaning, meaning, you know, in, in 1960, if you wanted to get a product created, it, it would have taken you a year and a half to do the whole thing and get, and finally have something that you can show for it, you know, and now because the world is flat, you know, you get on Alibaba, you send a message and three days later, you've got a prototype in your hand of this thing that you had an idea for. And now you started the e-commerce business and you made a million dollars in your first year selling a knickknack or whatever. Right. So, but when I was a student, I was literally in class working on MWI stuff in this class and answering the question, is the world flat while I was communicating with Josh who was in Hong Kong and with somebody we were working with in the Philippines who was helping us get something done. And then with somebody in the state, right. And I was, and I remember my teacher called me out or or I raised my hand and said, yeah, the world is flat. I mean, there's not much debate for this, right? Like, look at my thing. Look what I'm doing right now. This was not possible 10 years ago. This was not possible 20 years ago. I think we've seen that flattening happen in a lot of different ways. And it seems as though education is, is the next thing, right? I mean, it's, it's already started, but it's, everybody is going to have access in due time to the type of quality education that used to would have cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. There's a real good chance that that type of education is just going to have to be available to more people more directly through, through the internet. And those walls are going to have to come down, right? Because like you said, even, you know, hopefully COVID ends and this whole thing, you know, we don't have another pandemic around the corner, but like you said before, kind of the, well, I don't remember how you put it, but the sheet has been lifted off of it. It's right here for everybody to see. This is a broken system that needs fixing and let's figure it out. Josh, yeah. you have any thoughts on that? Josh is getting ready to go get a PhD himself. So I'm, I'm curious, you better hurry before, before you can't walk into those Harvard gates. Well, thankfully, uh, cause Clayton Christensen predicted that half of higher education would go out of business within the next 10, 15 years, something. But if the disruption begins at the bottom, hopefully, uh, the top ones are left long enough for me to get in and get out. And <laughs> well, I think even Clay but, mentioned that there, there are some exceptions. The ones, the ones with the, yeah, the huge endowments and the huge brands, he said they'll be fine. HPS will be the last to go under, right? <laughs> 
But yeah, it, it, it is really interesting because I look at this right now with COVID, you've got these students who are saying, wait, I'm paying 50 grand per semester for a Zoom class. Like, yeah. what am I getting out of this? And yeah, they still get the brand when they walk out, but they're not getting the experience. They're not really getting the network the same way that they would if they're on campus. But I think a lot of those students are also questioning everything about that system and saying, wait, I'm paying 50 grand for a Zoom class, but what was I paying 50 grand for before? Because the walk? I was paying 50 grand for the walk to class. Yeah. <laughs> to like sit in a room. Yeah. Yeah. Is the rest of it really worth the 50 grand too? And we kind of didn't question that before, but I, I suspect there's a lot of that questioning going on and that's kind of a tiny problem in the higher education space, but the, the bigger, more exciting part of it really is, gee, like, I mean, a lot of these universities are putting their lectures online and have been doing it for years. And so you can go watch all the MIT lectures for free. And how much does it take to add a little classroom component and a teacher advising you to that? Somebody you can go ask questions to. And how far away are we from being able to provide at least the quality of an Ivy League education for a couple hundred bucks or something. So that's somebody in India or the Philippines or something who grew up poor, but saves a couple thousand dollars can go get an Ivy league education. And yeah, they don't have the, maybe exactly the network or the the connections, but can we at least give them that quality of education? And then where does that take the world? If we can spread that to a couple million people, I mean, that's pretty exciting stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're literally democratizing education. And there's very few people who speak out against this caste system that we have with education, but it's, it's real. Like, I, I, I saw a lot of my colleagues in Santa Barbara who had their kids go to the best schools, and they took all the right steps, you know, to get them, including someone helping them with the essay and preparing for the exam to getting these places. And, and I think it is exciting. We're going to see that that go away. And I think you're also right about the curriculum. The, the content is there. The missing piece is the practitioner who can come in and help the students say, okay, here's all the stuff. Now we're going to show you how to apply it, how to actually use it. And we're going to somehow quantify your ability to do this. And personally, I think it's a huge opportunity for MWI. You guys should start like MWI higher education the material's already out there. And then you could be basically bringing on these students and actually letting them apply the stuff. It'd also be a good way to screen your new hires. Wheels have been turning love- the entire time we've been talking. So yeah, we're on the same page. <laughs> I love that. But something you've brought up a number of times during this conversation, Jason, is the confidence that comes with an education. And I got a master's degree at BYU in Provo in information systems management. And when people ask me what value I got from that, I often say, you know, I don't, I mean, all the technology I learned 20 years ago, that's all outdated. I mean, some of the principles stuck around, but just basic stuff. But really the, maybe the most valuable thing I got from that education was the confidence because half of my classes were MBA classes and I was sitting in these classes and I was running a business with 10 employees at the same time that I was getting my degree. And I was like, this is just like basic stuff. Like this is not super advanced. I mean, I knew that the people walking out of that program could not go run a business. They couldn't just walk out of there and run a team or anything. Like they would have to learn so much in the real world because I was learning the real world stuff alongside that curriculum. And so I walked out of that program. I was like, man, I know what these MBAs know. And I know that it's not that much and they might have the platform and maybe they're set up to learn, but it's not like they can just walk in and start running stuff and be successful from day one. And that confidence part was huge for me. Yeah, definitely agree on that point. Well, and I think that it shows the opportunity is this, this overlap between the two areas, because yeah, as, as I think as good business people who understand how things work, we, we point to academia and their ivory tower and their funny robes. And we're just like, what a joke. And the academics look down on, on us and say, oh, these guys, like, they're just like, oh, look at them get their hands dirty and it's all money grubbing and it's just, you know, we're above all that. But the truth is there is this place in between where you've, you've got the, the critical thinking skills and the frameworks to really think strategically, but then you've also got the, the practical 
knowledge and the, the tactics on how to apply it and, and make it work. Uh, I would, I would put it right up there with hope. Confidence will get you a long ways. It may get you in the wrong direction, but it'll get you a long ways. How can we take the online education, remote learning for people who don't have a lot of money and provide them with the education, provide them with the brand. I mean, that's pretty easy to slap the brand on something, but how can we also develop that real world experience and that confidence and put all of that together and do it remotely long distance so that they don't have to come live in Hawaii for four years at BYU Hawaii or go to Boston or go to wherever it is to some major university Because, man, if we could put all of that together and do it well so that people coming out of that could say, because, I mean, we kind of joke about online education in the past would be like, oh, University of Phoenix or something, you know, like, right, you you know, you got your online MBA. What good is that? But how can that be moved to the place where people look at an online MBA and say, hey, this is actually really, truly valuable and it's not just the brand. These people can actually do stuff. Are there some key missing pieces, like obvious missing pieces, or is that really the the game that it, it's not obvious and we still have to figure this out? I think that's where we'll see a few of these academics get off of their high horse and actually partner with really good companies. And I think what's missing is the guarantee. If you had something out there that says, look, you take our, our material, take our curriculum, you go through this course, we're going we're gonna to work you hard. We're going to work you a hundred hours a week, but we have a promise and that is you're going to get an interview with your top three companies. Like, like there's no university in the world right now that promises that. Right. But at the end of the day, that's, that's really, I think what a lot of these students are, are looking for. It's definitely what the parents of the students want. So the way we're actually going to measure ourselves as an institution and that is actual placement. It's not how many graduates we get or how many honors students there are is actually getting students with companies where they want to be. And we have this relationship with these companies where they know our program, they know how we're preparing the students and, and we promise them, can't promise them maybe necessarily a job, but you, you tell us your top three companies and you, you'll have a crack at it. You'll get, if you, if you do everything we've asked, we'll set up these interviews and we'll give you that chance. And I, I think that's really where you would see the bridge between these two worlds. I mean, firsthand experience, you're doing an amazing job of that at the Willis Center. I think you, you've been ahead of, of the curve on this and in our conversations for the last you know, five or six years. I'm excited to see what you guys continue to work out. I, I, think, I think you agree in Josh and I's mentality is it's kind of the same that any, any of these big hurdles or these big obstacles that we face are just opportunities for growth, for opportunities to mix things up and change things up and do things a different way and get a different perspective. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys continue to work out there in that little small school in the middle of the Pacific Island that is doing amazing things and making a big impact on the entire world. And a lot of it is just behind the scenes work that is by you and others that are working with you. Um, so yeah, I, I'm excited to see how it all pans out. Jason, we love you. We appreciate you, man. You know, there's not many people, I'll say it personally, in my own life that I've been able to learn as much from as I have from you, not just on the entrepreneurship side and not just on the business side, but also how to go about it the right way, you know, how to how to look for success for the right reasons. And then when you do see successes, whether they're big or small, you know, how to accept those successes and not just put it all into your ego, but try to take that and do something with it, you know, that's going to make the world a better place. And I know you don't know Josh as well, but I know Josh has seen your impact more indirectly and, and, you know, the stuff that I bring to the table after our conversations and stuff. So, you know, you're, you're a great mentor and we appreciate you and, and especially for taking some time to talk to us here and, and share your wisdom with us. Oh, I, I appreciate that. I, I think there is a reason why 70 million people watch Cobra Kai and people, they love to see the student become the master and you've definitely done that Corey. So I, I really appreciate what you and Josh do and um, just, yeah, just excited to keep moving forward. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. Good to talk. Hello, it's Corey here. And I just want to thank you so much for listening into the Hope Strategy Podcast. I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are enjoying having these amazing conversations with these incredible individuals talking about hope. We'd love it if you wouldn't mind liking, subscribing, and leaving us a review on iTunes or Spotify or anywhere that you listen to your podcasts and share it with anybody you feel that can benefit from these messages of hope. 
Thank you so much for listening to the Hope Strategy Podcast.